want you to hit me as hard as you can. In the last decade, movie trailers have risen to an art form. The very best of them can lay out its premise, but never spoil a single plot point. But Rogue One is next level. Through each of its well-cut trailers, we are simultaneously given a tale about a galactic civil war, while inadvertently telling the story of a film in the midst of its troubled production. Disney's first standalone Star Wars film had all the signs of an impending train wreck, and by watching every trailer and featurette, we can follow a bizarre digital paper trail to find out what the f happened to this movie. In 2012, George Lucas made producer Kathleen Kennedy the head of Lucasfilm Limited, then sold the studio he created to the Walt Disney Company for a whopping $4 billion. Lucas felt that Disney would be the right people to carry the Star Wars torch, though he later came to regret that decision. Almost immediately, Disney began developing new Star Wars films. Enter Industrial Light and Magic's visual effects supervisor, John Knoll. He had an idea for a standalone Star Wars film, based off of the first two paragraphs from the original Star Wars opening crawl. A decade before the buyout, he had pitched to Lucasfilm a Mission Impossible-style TV show about stealing the plans to the Death Star. But nothing came out of it. When Disney took over, he pitched it once more. Disney was keen on expanding the Star Wars universe beyond the Skywalker saga, an idea originating from Lucas. So Kennedy ran with Knoll's idea. In early 2013, Disney and Lucasfilm announced two standalone films to be written and produced by Simon Kinberg and Star Wars vet Lawrence Kasdan. No plot or description was given, but the plan was to release these films in between the mainline episodes, essentially making Star Wars an annualized event for the foreseeable future. A year went by without much news regarding the standalones, as most of that attention was directed at J.J. Abrams and his Episode 7. The world was waiting to see how Disney handled their first film with the Star Wars franchise. Failure will find you explaining why to a far less patient audience. While making Warner Brothers' tentpole Godzilla film, director Gareth Edwards was approached by Disney. Exhausted from his current shoot, Edwards hoped the pitch was going to suck. But by the end, he knew the opportunity was too good to pass up. Barely a week after Godzilla's release in May of 2014, Edwards signed on to direct the first standalone Star Wars film, this being only his third time in the director's chair. Gary Whitta, who co-wrote M. Night Shyamalan's After Earth, also joined to write the screenplay. That following June, Josh Trank was hired for the second standalone, his third film as well, after the Fantastic Four reboot. Disney was clearly looking for younger talent to develop their emerging universe with fresh ideas. Again, the public was still in the dark regarding the plot of either film. Rumors about Disney's desire to flesh out pre-existing characters fueled talk of films tackling Han Solo, Yoda, Obi-Wan, and even Boba Fett. Boba Fett. Behind closed doors, one was Noel's idea coming to fruition. In January of 2015, Witta officially left the project, and Disney brought in Chris Weitz, who had just wrote their live-action Cinderella film. But by the time shooting started, Weitz had passed the script on to multiple other screenwriters, including Jason Bourne veteran Tony Gilroy, frequent Steven Soderbergh collaborator Scott Burns, and master script doctor Christopher McQuarrie. Earlier versions of Rogue One's script had Jin as a sergeant within the Empire, she being the turncoat, not Bodhi, and explained why the rebel base on Dantooine was abandoned. Our scout ships have reached Dantooine. They found the remains of a rebel base, but they estimate that it has been deserted for some time. All those drafts did follow roughly the same plotline, and always led directly into the beginning of A New Hope, with Darth Vader as an ever-present threat. The biggest differences were the endings. The filmmakers assumed the family-friendly Disney would never had let them kill off all their characters, so they had a few of them survive in some rather silly ways. The craziest version had Cassian throwing a carbon freezing bomb at the team as their ship blows up, leaving them safely encased in carbonite, but floating adrift in space. Then Vader force chokes Krennic to death, and the film ends. But in a meeting with Disney, Edwards and Whites asked for permission to write the harsher ending, where all the characters sacrifice themselves, expecting some pushback. Much to their surprise, Disney was very supportive of the idea. Not only would it not make sense why those characters weren't in Episode 4, but it served the greater purpose of the cost of war. That March, Disney revealed the title as Rogue One, releasing December 16th, 2016, and starring Felicity Jones. Again, for the third time, no plot details.
Disney held off on the big reveal until the Star Wars Celebration fan event in April. The event mostly revolved around Abrams' The Force Awakens. And that dope trailer moment... Chewie, we're home. But they also had a panel for their standalones, now being called anthology films. Here, Edwards and Kennedy unveiled Rogue One as a gritty war film, inspired by Saving Private Ryan and Black Hawk Down, and that, yes, it would be about the rebel spies stealing secret plans to the Empire's ultimate weapon. The film would not include the Force or Jedi. There are no Jedi here anymore. Only dreamers like this fool. The Force did protect me. I protected you. They also showed a mini teaser set to Obi-Wan's Before the Empire speech from A New Hope, where a fly through the jungle pans up to a giant moon on the horizon, only for the twist. That's no moon. The panel finished with only Rogue One as the discussed anthology film, with no news about Josh Trinks, as he was too sick to attend. Or was he? You should probably watch this next. Filming on Rogue One began in early August of 2015, and principal photography was relatively quiet. However, if Rogue One is known for anything, it's all the removed bits and pieces from the trailers, which unwittingly highlighted the behind-the-scenes turmoil. To be fair, the film represented was the film we got. But the overabundance of promotional material contained a fair amount of footage and dialogue that was missing from the final cut. And it's difficult to talk about Rogue One's production without simultaneously discussing what happened during its reshoots and edit. A few stories over the following years have shed light as to why certain things were used, removed, or changed. Yet, to this day, it still isn't entirely clear what transpired. With that in mind, let's dive in. During filming, Edwards didn't want to stifle the cast and crew's independent film side. So they had what Edwards called Indie Hour, where they just shot striking images that had no intention of being in the final film. It was just a way of the crew understanding, like, for an hour, we're just going to do loads of random shit. And, and don't try and ask, don't, we can't explain. And it would just be things that felt like, I think this is a beautiful moment, this is a great idea. Edwards only confirmed two of these shots, Felicity Jones in the tunnel and Ben Mendelsohn standing alone. The marketing team found hours of this stuff and chose to put them in the trailers. Additionally, Edwards had an unusual way of directing his actors. In an interview, Mendelssohn stated that each of his scenes were filmed with what he called different renderings, meaning he would play Krennic with a variety of emotions and states of mind to give the filmmakers options on which way to take the character in the final edit. For example, Krennic's demeanor toward Vader, going from arrogant... The power that we are dealing with here is immeasurable. ...to frightened. I deserve an audience to make certain that he understands its remarkable potential. Or Jin being defiant with the rebels. Let's just get this over with, shall we? Versus oblivious. What is this? Rogue One wrapped in February of 2016. And soon after, the rumors began that the film was in trouble. Whether true or not, evidently Disney wasn't satisfied with Edward's first rough cut. It was so rough, in fact, Disney brought Tony Gilroy back to advise on reshoots. Gilroy had a strong working relationship with Kathleen Kennedy's husband, producer Frank Marshall. The two of them came together to help save Doug Lyman's Born Identity in 2002. Gilroy also had worked with Edwards before, as he had an uncredited rewrite on Godzilla. He was a logical choice. Gilroy surveyed the situation and began writing fixes. Disney scheduled four to five weeks of pickups for the summer with Gilroy serving as a second unit director. Now, reshoots are common, especially for costly blockbusters, but Rogue Ones were hefty. Numerous sources have confirmed that the reshoots were beyond extensive. Nearly all the filmmakers have said so. From what we know, Gilroy added the introduction scenes of Cassian assassinating his informant, Bodhi being transported through Jetta, Jin in prison, and her subsequent rescue. The most sizable confirmed change is how the ending plays out. Per Edwards, the original layout of Scarif had the data vault separate from the transmission tower. This explains all the cut footage of Jin and Cassian fighting along the beaches, holding on to the Death Star plans. With the simple act of combining the two buildings, the plot points of each character fell like dominoes and had to be restructured. One behind the scenes feature, weirdly, showed what looks like K2SO being shot to death. 
but his body lands in sand next to Cassian? This feasibly could have been their original deaths, giving credence to how the new ending affected everything. How much else was reshot is still debatable, and the scenes aren't easily discernible from the rest of the film. Whatever other changes Gilroy made obviously caused a ripple effect across the rest of the film, like Vader moving from the Death Star to his Mustafar fortress. Forrest Whitaker's Saw Gerrera is probably the biggest mystery and casualty of this. Kathleen Kennedy mentioned they had big plans for Saw, a character they pulled from the Clone Wars TV show. But at some point, that all went out the window. One featurette shows adult Jin with a shaved head Saw, perhaps training her as a rebel, while giving foreboding speeches, I guess. What will you do when they catch you? What will you do if they break you? If you continue to fight, what will you become? But all of that is gone. Then you have Bodhi, where Riz Ahmed hinted that his character was reconstructed entirely throughout the reshoots, which might mean a good bulk of his scenes were replacements. And some trailers suggest the Rebels weren't fully aware what the Death Star was yet. A major weapons test is imminent. We need to know what it is and how to destroy it. All these moving parts revolve around Saw and seem to be shuffled about, now with Saw as more of a plot device to get to the reimagined Bodhi. In turn, this altered what the Rebels actually needed from Jin, hence their scene changing from trailer to trailer. There's also a big logic leap with Jin blaming the Rebels for killing her father, only for her very next scene to be an attempt to rally the Rebels with a message of hope. This could be an oversight from the pickups or a result of starting the film without a finalized script. In the end, Edwards said that the effect shots tripled with the reshoots. For a film that promoted its usage of practical sets, it makes you wonder what those shots could possibly be. My guess would be the space battle, since there are no shots of that sequence in the earlier trailers. Still, there are so many shots and chunks of dialogue missing that we have no context for their absence, and we might never know. Contrary to a popular internet rumor, no version filmed had any of the team members survive, even though Felicity Jones signed a two-picture deal. By August, Gilroy took the lead on post-production, bringing in his brother John to help with the editing and Edwards taking a back seat. Normally in these situations, you hear about the director being sidelined or possibly fired, causing wide speculation that a film was in dire straits. Unconfirmed reports claimed as much as 40% of Rogue One was being reshot and suggested Gilroy ghost-directed much of the movie. Yet, in this case, Edwards was still very much involved, collaborating with Gilroy during reshoots and editing. To his credit, Edwards has always been very open about this, showing that he understood the problems his film had and would do anything to fix it. Gilroy, on the other hand, was less cordial about the proceedings. A year and a half after the film's release, Gilroy gave a rather candid and not very tactful interview where he seemingly throws everyone under the bus. Well, they were just in so much terrible, terrible trouble that all you could do is, 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 is improve their position. As well as touting his strength of not liking Star Wars. In fact, that was my superpower. A, I don't like Star Wars. Not that I don't like, I just never been interested in Star Wars ever. And revealing his hero complex. I came in after the director's cut. I have a screenplay credit in the arbitration that was easily won. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, director. For all his work, Gilroy was paid $5 million and shares writing credit with Chris Weitz. Outside all this production mayhem, Rogue One also decided to take a detour through the uncanny valley and raise the dead. When Edwards ran across the original Prince of a New Hope in a storage vault, he couldn't resist the chance of putting unused footage of the rebel pilots into the battle over Scarif. It's a widely appreciated nod to the squadrons that would clearly be alive for the Death Star trench run. Mostly. That's fine! I need help! Red 5 standing by. On the opposite side of the tasteful spectrum, the filmmakers revived the long-deceased Peter Cushing in the commonly criticized Grand Moff Tarkin scenes. Using actor Guy Henry for his voice in motion capture, scanning a face mold made for the comedy Top Secret, and utilizing all the latest advancements in CGI, ILM brought a near convincing Cushing back to life. Although they received the blessing of his estate, it was still an unsettling effect that spawned an ethics debate over the use of such tech. 
And it didn't help that ILM used the same technique for the Princess Leia scene, instead of, say, the way the MCU de-ages their stars. Then it became far too eerie when Carrie Fisher died tragically two weeks after Rogue One's release. The last addition to the film came only a mere months before opening weekend. While nailing down the final cut, editor Jabez Olson suggested they include one more sequence with Darth Vader. Kennedy gave the go-ahead, and in three days, Edwards made the Vader hallway scene, easily going down as one of the greatest Star Wars moments of all time. I wanted to have a cameo in the film because I love Star Wars so much, but I was saving it for the right thing and it felt very appropriate to play the guy who runs down the corridor and pulls the handle because that way I get to survive and therefore technically, according to Star Wars canon, I'm in episode 4 A New Hope. Rogue One released on December 16th, 2016. Despite a year of negative press and endless rumors, Disney's first Star Wars film to break from the Skywalker saga was an enormous hit. The reviews were generally positive, pointing out the messy first half, but reveling in the rousing third act. It also made a stupid amount of money. Its opening weekend alone pulled in 155 million and ended with a worldwide haul of over a billion. Billion with a B. Not bad for a movie that essentially fills in a two meter wide plot hole from the original Star Wars. Disney made an extraordinary gamble with Rogue One. By reopening a wound and repairing what was wrong, showed a commitment to deliver on quality, no matter the cost. And in that sense, they should receive some credit. Of course, they could have delayed the film rather than try to meet a release date, but these are the times we live in. But what about all the stuff in the trailers that wasn't in the movie, you say? Does it matter? Did it matter? Movie trailers have always been a tricky balance. They have to show enough that you'll buy a ticket, but still want you to be surprised by its twists and turns, even though focus groups are constantly telling them to spoil everything. And people will complain about any route a trailer takes regardless. But the common thread is that audiences just don't want to be lied to by the film they were sold in the trailers to the finished product they see in theaters. Don't advertise a stylized action flick when it's an atmospheric indie drama, or a dark revenge thriller when it's a wall-to-wall -wall musical. Rogue One never lied about what it was. We still got a beautiful, entertaining sci-fi flick masquerading as a war film. We still got a menacing Death Star, beach warfare, towering AT-ATs, outgun rebels, the return of Darth Vader, and Forrest Whitaker talking funny. So again, what does it matter? A recent trend is to have shots made explicitly for a trailer, not to mislead, but to condense the movie into single ideas so you know what you're in for, while also keeping all the big surprises a secret. Maybe we should just think of Rogue One's trailers that way. Disney's marketing team were the ones that came up with the Jin vs. TIE Fighter shot that Edwards reluctantly agreed to include. To them, it perfectly conveys the film's David vs. Goliath parable. The weak vs. the strong. The oppressed vs. the oppressors. The rebels vs. the empire. And that's all it was. Rogue One in three seconds.